before I pivot, Gert. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, yeah, before we pivot away from struggles, I would like to talk about Gert. Welcome to Star Squad Pod, the media podcast with a wide-eyed commitment to truth and justice. I am Nicole Sweeney. My name is Marines. And joining us again this week is... Sari Riley. Hello. I work at Complexly with Nicole in the same office now, but on different things. I do script editing and sometimes writing for SciShow and for Crash Course Film. Yeah. Yeah. And you do other, other media-y things. You're on a bunch of, you're on all sorts of podcasts now because you're on I'm, Real Bad and yep. the SciShow podcast and... You work on Monstrous. I work on Monstrous. Yeah, I do comic stuff, which is why comic discussions are always really fun and exciting. (laughs) Yeah, I have a degree in media and I care a lot about TV and stories and everything and have a lot of feelings. So (laughs) this is a lot of fun. (laughs) So you fit right in. So this week we are actually talking about a comic book adaptation, but I don't think any of us have actually read any of the comics. No. Is that correct? Okay. (laughs) I know the writer and like I've read some of his other stuff. (laughs) Same, yeah. (laughs) But we are talking about Marvel's Runaways, uh, which is a 10 episode series created for Hulu. And Sari, you want to give the good people a plot synopsis? Also, as always, spoilers ahoy if that's a problem for you. (laughs) Yeah, don't listen if you don't want to be spoiled for all 10 episodes. Runaways centers around the story of six kids who... Growing up, they presumably um, got together because all of their parents were members of an organization called The Pride. They're all wealthy kids, and The Pride is public-facing a charity organization. They're, like, helping build a new school for, I don't know, the rich kids of L.A., and probably very STEM-focused because it seems like a lot of these parents are... I am going to interject that the school is in fucking what's his name's dad's old neighborhood so presumably mm, not yes it's yeah somewhere yeah. so the school is presumably for like poor kids underprivileged yeah yeah, yeah. no that's a good point <laughs> but carry on thank Other, you otherwise correct <laughs> otherwise correct yeah they're they're front facing as a charity organization but you find out in the first episode where because of a series of unfortunate events these kids <laughs> who uh grew very apart come back together to alex's big mansion um Um, And they stumble upon a basement ritual in which their parents are all all wearing red robes and sacrificing a girl named Destiny Gonzalez, who's a runaway young adult who ended up in a church cult group, which we'll go into in a little bit. Uh, (laughs) And they're sacrificing her by putting her into this big, light, alien-looking pod. And then they're freaked out because their parents are presumably very evil and they didn't realize it. So I think the best way to do the plot summary is to go into each of the main characters really briefly. Okay, uh, okay. Because the whole story is them figuring out that, one, they have usually some sort of supernatural power or ability and figuring out what their parents do for the pride. So the like the head of the group, I guess, is Alex Wilder. He is uh, a tech nerd and his parents are a real estate ex-con and a lawyer. And so he is kind of like the de facto leader of the group, but he does a lot of like the hacking into systems stuff. Uh, and he his parents are kind of critical to the group because they own the property that the school is supposedly being built on, but it actually is the center of one of the bigger mysteries, which is they're drilling down to obtain a substance or potentially a living creature. Yeah, still, that that is still, un- what exactly is at the bottom of the mine is still unresolved. Unknown. Yeah. Nico Minoru, who is a goth witch, <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe bisexual icon, who knows? Yeah, goth witch, bisexual icon, yeah, that's correct. That's <laughs> I love her. Uh, her, I couldn't tell. uh, Yeah. Her parents, her mom is the CEO of a company called Wizard, which is basically like the fictional Apple. Uh, It seems like their technology is in everything, like phones and TVs. And the main storyline that involves her is that she had a sister named Amy who died, presumably of suicide, but you find out later that she was doing her own investigation, um, rebelling against her parents, and got killed as a a consequence of that. There's Gertrude, or Gert Yorks. Uh, She's like 
the purple haired, chipper, outspoken activist, which I want to discuss her later because <laughs> I feel like they dealt with her weirdly. Yeah. And she has a link with a dinosaur who she names Old Lace, who her parents uh, genetically engineered. And they're kind of like the crunchy hippie scientists uh, of the bunch. And they work on biology stuff is pretty much all you need to know. <laughs> Molly Hernandez is adopted by the crunchy biologists. And she <laughs> <laughs> she is super strong. Uh, she's also younger and very snarky. So she is great, too. Her parents were geophysicists, I think, or geologists, something to do with seismology. And they were involved in the pride but got killed in a fire uh, that we learn later on was intentionally set by one of the other parents because they got too close to figuring out that what they were doing maybe wasn't good and wanted to potentially back out of the group. Carolina Dean, who's a, a rainbow sapphic goddess, <laughs> is what I have written down. <laughs> uh, correct. Correct. But... Also, maybe an alien, also part of a cult, the Church of, I, I don't know how to pronounce Giborum? it. Giborum. Giborum. Yeah. That her mom and ancestors helped found and create and created all these scriptures. But her dad is actually like an evil alien who glows rainbow too, but in a menacing way, maybe. Um, <laughs> and also dies. He glows an evil rainbow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He glows an evil rainbow, and if he doesn't sap the energy of other living beings, he becomes like a shriveled mummy. He's the reason thing. that the rest of the group has been killing teenagers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chase Stein is, uh, he's a lacrosse jock, but who also is apparently super smart and engineering genius, too. Um, and he has a stay-at-home mom, and then his dad, who is Spike from Buffy. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the first thing I noticed about the show is just like, oh, oh okay. Yeah. yeah. The <laughs> casting him and then also the evil alien, too, is from mm -hmm. Charmed. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. like, a very good use of the, like, retro casting, I guess. I don't, like, I don't, that's a weird way to describe it. But similar to Riverdale in, like, the way that they cast the parents. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting and good. Yes. <laughs> very. But anyway, he's, his dad is like a super genius has invented a lot of technology, self-driving cars, whatnot. But he's also like an abusive dad and that plays into the storyline a lot too. So with all that in mind, those are all the pieces <laughs> at play. And throughout the 10 episodes, they discover their powers. They realize that their parents are doing evil and they're trying to untangle their web of lies and the parents are realizing that they're in over their heads too because this alien guy, Jacob, who is... I guess he shows up again. Uh, no, he was he was dead, kind of, <laughs> but then got revived. But during this revival, he decided to show his face around the parents because they were getting close to actually drilling down to this thing that he wants. And then the parents realize that they the one thing that they want to do is protect their kids. And so there's a big battle. And eventually the runaways become the runaways because they have to run away from their rich kid life and figure out what to do next. And the series ends with them on a public watch list, I yeah, guess. So yeah. there's a TV broadcast saying that these kids are now felons who murdered Destiny Gonzalez, who like it, the energy transfer didn't work and she washed up on a beach and is now it's now being treated as a murder case. There's a lot of subplots here. And yeah. so <laughs> I feel like I did a very bad job of summarizing everything. No, there's, there's a lot of, there are a lot of subplots. There are a lot of moving pieces and this is actually an important point to bring up. Sari and I were kind of talking about this beforehand about how Sari does not watch a lot of like soap opera -y type stuff. And it is important to note that Josh Schwartz, who created this show, also created The O.C. and Gossip Girl. So teenage soap opera is like his bread and butter. <laughs> and this is very much that. Yeah. Uh, this is very and like a ton of moving parts, but not in the like Game of Thrones way of a ton of moving parts, like in the soap opera way of a ton of moving parts where like mm -hmm. there's a lot of moving parts and they're only going to matter if they need to matter. <laughs> like they can be they can be followed through or they can be left. And and it it is. Yeah. <laughs> so that is that is very much a thing that is happening here in this particular storytelling experience. So, Mari, what did you think of this show? You are the person who I have not yet heard from. I don't I, I know nothing of your immediate reactions to this. 
I thought it was okay. I was probably, I was expecting maybe more because I had heard people talk about it a lot. And I don't want to give the impression that I had a negative experience. So like the best way that I can think to, to kind of describe this is looking at everything that we've talked about so far on the podcast from like a scale of Midnight Texas to the Marvelous (laughs) Mrs. Maisel. Like this would come in solidly in the middle, maybe the bottom portion of that list, but it, it, it was okay. It wasn't my favorite thing that we watched. I think it had good points, but my biggest complaint about it was that it was incredibly slow. The pacing was all over the place. It was it was dragged out to hell. And I think because of what we've already mentioned about all of those characters and all of those moving parts, I, I think that when you look at Josh Schwartz and like the OC or the Gossip Girl, there are a lot of moving parts, but he he corrects that with an air of like ridiculousness. And there's so much like, I don't know, intrigue and just things are moving very quickly, which I think this show was missing. It was very, very dragged out to me. And so it wasn't kind of as fun in that cheesy, campy way that his other shows are. Huh. That's interesting. So I, full disclosure, I have seen all of the OC, most of it more than more than once. I watched most of Gossip Girl. I dropped out in like the final two seasons before like the the cynicism of the Gossip Girl worldview kind of got to me and I couldn't take it anymore. But I, yeah, so I, this, this kind of like soapy teenager shit is very much like this is, this is my trash. I, it's interesting that you say that to me. I still found it like plenty campy. I definitely think it is a lot lighter than either of those two shows. Like for sure, it is way, it's like it's fluff in a way that I don't think, I don't think that is quite the way I would describe either The O.C. or Gossip Girl, just because both of those shows air darker in a way that this doesn't. And and so, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that there are, there are some like very obvious flaws in its storytelling, some ways in which characters are just kind of wishy-washy. And like, personally, my biggest fix for this would be to lean more into the idea of the parents as villains. Like, I think I think the idea of trying to redeem the parents made the show weaker. Uh, and it like and it took away some of the potential for you know, the kids breaking out on their own in this big way. And, and, and also like the parents were killing teenagers every year for 15 Mm -hmm. years. So like these like weird attempts at redemption are like, I'm not buying it. Like (laughs) I'm not, I'm not here for this idea that like I should feel bad for them because like they were doing pretty clearly evil things knowingly. And so, yeah, that whole, the, the ambiguity surrounding the, the parents, bothered me and I think I think that you could have leaned more into the I think that a a, like a flatter view of the parents that like like they're just evil would have made it work better from that kind of camp I don't know camp isn't quite the right word but I think I think probably would have addressed some of what you are speaking to in terms of what was like missing here maybe I don't know that's that's like an immediate thought I think I'm probably coming to this I also watched all of the OC I probably watched maybe two seasons when it was airing and then we recapped for the blog. So I watched all of it again for that project. And I saw maybe two seasons of Gossip Girl before I hit my limit with that. So I am probably not a big fan of like the soapy teen drama always, but I came to this as a fan of superhero stories and comics and looking at it through that lens, I think this made some really interesting pacing and storytelling decisions. And to be clear about like the, the, the pacing, just the best way for me to kind of explain or give examples. So we go through this very, very slow pilot because it has the work of introducing all six kids and then all of their parents and establishing each of them have a pretty it's basically two home. pilots too. Yes. Because we do the kid, then, one for the kids and then one for the parents. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like I went through this entire thing and by the end of the pilot, I really didn't know what was going on. And I hadn't re- read any of the Runaways comics and I, I mean, it's called Runaways. So I had kind of an idea what was going to happen, but <laughs> I didn't didn't really know what it was about. And by the end of the first episode, I still didn't feel like I knew what it was about. And then you start episode two and they do it all over again. (laughs) And they just go back and they're showing you the exact same episode 
basically. And I was like, are you kidding me? And it had those moments where it was just these really drawn out things. And I think a really good example of, of that is that you get a scene where they are at the wizard, aka Apple headquarters, and they're <laughs> breaking into the mom's office. And Alex um, knows the password. And and Nico kind of picks up on that and wants to know how he knew the password. And I think we we spend the end of one episode and the beginning of the next one with her asking him, no lie, like three or four times, how did he know the password? And every time, like, something happens where he doesn't tell the truth or they're interrupted. And it got dragged out across two episodes. And it was like, are you kidding me right now? Like, there were so many of those little moments that were just dra- drawn out. And I think it made this a lot slower for a show where you kind of know the premise going in they're gonna run away and they don't do that till episode 10 like that was my thing or like yeah okay get to we know what's coming we know what's happening and it just didn't get there quick enough for me that that in particular is a really good example of one that like when we get to the reveal I don't like the show's argument for why he kept this secret from her for two years was not compelling to me like not only did it take in the, within the timeline of the show it took way too long to get to the reveal I totally agree with you I like I definitely felt that like come on let's do this and then once it happened I was like this is this makes no sense that the, that this information was not already on the table like I I do not buy like any of this <laughs> I just especially like when all of this started the fact that Alex wouldn't have have made any connections between what Amy knew like I maybe I maybe buy like because they all fell out they stopped being friends that like Alex wouldn't have spoken to any of them about this and and whatever I, reaching a little bit but yeah. at the beginning of this when they decide oh shit our parents are maybe evil for Alex to not jump in and say by the way Amy was <laughs> investigating your mother yeah. <laughs> Amy's death was maybe not a suicide yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> even if he, Alex had no reason to suspect that her death wasn't a suicide but because he his 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 belief was that Amy like killed herself Maybe. because she was afraid of what her mom would mom, do yeah yeah so Alex Alex believes that her death is a suicide but that like she was genuinely af- genuinely and deeply afraid of her mother and and as they're speculating about whether their parents are evil, hey, by the way, your sister killed herself because I think your sister killed herself because she believed that your mom was so evil that that was better than, you know, mm-hmm. whatever that. Yeah. The, I Yes. The <laughs> that information took way too long to believably be revealed. Uh, and also the other the other thing on that pacing, I watched this as it was airing and then I was homesick on Friday. So I was just like, I don't know, I guess I'll like watch it. So I was like half watching it and half doing, half like doodling basically uh, on my couch on Friday. But I, when I got to the final episode, I was briefly confused that like maybe this was a 12 episode series and not a 10 episode series because we come into the final episode and like, so because I had already seen it because I knew what happened, I was like, oh shit, the part where they actually run away and like, like are are actually like on you know out on their own and then like whatever the warrant being put out for for them I was convinced that that had to take like several episodes like everything Mm -hmm. that happens in that last episode like you you could have all of like the drag that happens earlier in the season is weird given the accelerated pace of the end of the season you know like you you could have stretched like evened that out a little bit better yes I feel like I had similar problems with the pacing and some of it may have been in the adaptation from comic to tv so I like read a little bit of the wikipedia page um that's my extent of knowing the comics but (laughs) my impression of them is that the pride in that they were just like straight up super villains every one of their parents had powers they were just like evil to begin with but they were trying to make their parents a lot more nuanced in the show and they kind of dwelled on that too much to the point where for me it felt like we were trying to unpack their motivations but I was confused about their motivations during most of it the the flashbacks were a little excessive in my opinion mostly because it felt like they were there and interrupted the story like the present day mystery. I think they were useful to provide context because there were so many subplots going on and it felt kind of comic booky because in comics you can flash back to something and flash forward again pretty easily. But 
the fact that their appearances didn't change very much from the present day to the past and they jumped all around in the past. There was like 15 years ago and eight years ago and one year ago and a bunch of different time points in the past that felt like space that it could have they could have spent in the present like moving forward in the mystery, getting closer to the point of the final confrontation rather than dropping all these hints for the mysteries that they were solving without fully un- un- without fully uncovering the truth um, in the same way that Alex was kind of teasing the password reveal to Nico. It was like they were they were trying to build up too many mysteries and tease too many solutions when they could have just like dropped them, moved on and develop the story that way. Another thing that I picked up from the my brief reading of the Wikipedia page, <laughs> which is like, you know, always a good, a good way to start a point, is I think that they also, like you were mentioning, the parents are super villains and they have powers. And I think that this show try, tried to ground the hero aspect and the, you know, that, that kind of aspect of the story a little bit more so that you have almost an explanation to everything. So where in the comics, Nico really is a bisexual Wicca, (laughs) Wiccan, like, you know, here it's almost like, no, 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 it's science. It uses your blood. And, you know, she invented this in a lab. The The staff can be explained. And I think we set so much time setting up all of their all of that explanation and all of that backstory of like the science behind it all, that it takes something away, I think, from like the this idea of a superhero story where, you know, sometimes you just got powers, man. And, <laughs> and I think, it, I mean, there was even a moment where Gert is singing, which she has a lovely voice. And it was like more singing, but it never, it never <laughs> happened. And we hear like the singing kind of travels down and you, had this moment of establishing that the dinosaur is listening and so Mm -hmm. later I'm like is that why they have a connection like why why establish that why why can't it just be like a power thing which nothing is except for maybe the aliens which again is more science fiction than it is fantasy so I think that you have that where I think it was doing too much to establish those things and I think it also puts this in kind of a limbo where it's not full on superhero story but it's not full on like teen soapy drama either if you've only got one dance in 10 episodes and you're only there for a hot second like you're you're not, <laughs> you're not a teen failed drama as a show. teen soap opera yeah, yeah. <laughs> do not qualify so i think it was just a show that was in a weird weird limbo yeah i think my favorite places in the show were when those moments intersected when it was like it amped up the teen drama by bringing in their powers in some way like this isn't the best example but i remember remember thinking it was a cool moment like when Chase and Carolina are on the rooftop um, at the gala and she's like drinking because she's in conflict about finding out that her parents are evil he follows her up there and she's sitting on the edge of the roof and she drops the bottle of vodka off and then turns around and falls off and in the process he pulls off her cult bracelet which is raining in her alien powers Mm -hmm. and she like starts glowing and she starts flying and I think that is a moment where like in a teen drama you would have some sort of drunken shenanigans or like danger because of that but this is amped up to show that to like reveal a different aspect of her power and I thought that was like a very cool use of both genres yeah but I agree with you Mari where most of the time it felt like it was dabbling in both but didn't really commit to either one or use the best aspects of both of them because like I, I was also to, expecting yeah. a superhero I have to like um, amend my statement because I forgot about the gala so it was like one and a half <laughs> that's, two, no, that's two yep 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 that's two they got to wear fancy fancy clothes twice yeah <laughs> I think finding more moments of intersection between like teen soap and hero stuff would have made this experience, entire experience a whole lot better. I am curious to see where the show goes because I feel like this whole season was so heavy on the setup. It was. And it's like assuming, assuming that it it gets an additional season. Like I, I feel like, I feel like I do not know how to assess what this was at this point because it was it was like a season of setup, right? Like that, like that's what this entire thing was was like the origin story. And I don't know, it was a like 
it was a moderately well executed origin story, like highs and lows, I guess, I think. I, but I am curious to see where they take it, I guess. I don't know. I feel like the person that we have talked about least of the core characters is Gert. And Sari said at the beginning that she wanted to, to revisit <laughs> Gert. So, Sari. <laughs> Put a pin in that. Okay, I don't know how I feel about her characterization and whether it was, like, just bad because it was bad or it was intentionally <laughs> bad. Um, so she's portrayed as this social activist like in the first episode you see her passing out flyers for a club that she's founding that is some sort of feminist on campus group but a lot of her lines are like really painfully blunt just like using words that people would use in a social justice context so she says that dating is heteronormative or (laughs) she calls people out for like supporting the patriarchy or just she's often like, like a caricature of, yes of like like somebody was like teenage girl on tumblr yes like i wonder what's like the archetype of of teenage girl on tumblr today i and was just gonna say like i don't know who wrote this but in my head i can imagine a room full of male writers like shit <laughs> <laughs> We need to write a feminist. Someone get on Tumblr quick. And that's how all of her lines were delivered. Yeah. Yeah. And she just spent a lot of it, like, calling out other people for really random small things. Like, a lot of her dialogue didn't really have a point besides her just being fed up with the way society is in in a, like, self righteous way. And a lot of her interactions with other characters were uh, talking to Carolina and being all swoony over Chase, which was really annoying. Like the one for all of the lines that she was given to say <laughs> about female empowerment, she was also written in a love triangle, like a forced love triangle by her own creation with Carolina and Chase. And that was a really frustrating use of her character, I think. I I don't know. I have mixed emotions about that because there's a certain degree to which her like basic pettiness also rang true. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know. Like, I, I don't think like as much as there there's a lot of things that I would like to see more of in my media and less of in my media. And like, yes, like teenage girls fighting over boys is for sure on the list of things I would like to see less of in my media. But at the same time, there's also this measure of like, you have the thing that I want. And and, and like, I don't know, like there's there's a degree to which it rang true, yes. I guess, like that, like her her reluctance with Carolina. I yeah, I, I agree with you on the whole that she is not well characterized. But I don't know that like that just to me like that, that dynamic I liked. I was cool with her with her having that as like kind of a fundamental flaw of hers and and like ha- that being a thing that she and Caroline like they overcame and like they became really good friends and and whatever like I, but I think I do agree that the whole idea of her as this social justice warrior character was constructed in this way that like absolutely uh, as as Mari said, s- sounded like just a room full of white dudes. <laughs> like I don't know, yeah, quick to Tumblr, basically, <laughs> and that was that was a bit of a struggle. However, I will say that I I did thoroughly enjoy the the club when people find. So she tr- tries to start this club. There appears to be no interest, but then like randomly, some kids show up and are like, "Hey, we're ready for this first meeting." And she's like, "Ah, like I just learned my parents are evil. I totally forgot about this club." And one of the kids is wearing. And I'm with her <laughs> shirt that he, he wrote over to say I'm with Gert. And he says, this shirt no longer fills me with unspeakable sadness. <laughs> and I died laughing because mm-hmm. I feel that. Yeah. <laughs> that. See, that was like a funny, good moment. Yeah. And I feel like if, if there were more... If they treated her character more cleverly instead of just giving these one-liners that you're supposed to be kind of antagonized by or laugh at instead of actually understand, then she would have been fine. But yeah, yes. Of all the frustrating moments where somebody could have used their words to make something better, (laughs) 
uh, th- there were a lot in the series. The teenagers not wanting to talk about their crushes was like the one that I'm like, okay, I get it. Like that, that was yeah. fine with mm-hmm. me. That whole idea of like her, like, no, I don't like Chase. And you know, that, that rang okay. The idea that like five or six episodes in when they were still discovering powers, nobody wanted to talk about it. Like that made me more upset. I'm like, yes. oh my God, just share your goddamn yes. powers. But, totally. But, but like the love triangle stuff, that, that was okay with me. And I think on the whole, the characters all started with these very, I mean, it's basically like a breakfast club set up at the very beginning where you have the jock and the goth girl and, you know, she's the social justice one. And I was hoping as the series went on that we would climb a little bit more out of those tropes, but I don't think we ever did. I think that, you know, they're looking at something like Riverdale, where you have the same thing, where they started episode one with these tropes as well. You know, the rich girl just moved to town and the good girl and, you know, the hot boy. And they kind of move away from that in a lot of ways, where they show you everybody struggles and and, inner darkness. I didn't get a ton of that here. Yeah, totally. I wish that what they did with her character was let her grow as a feminist, if that makes sense, because I... I get that that is how the world sees a lot of like the social justice warrior Tumblr culture, but she's also a kid in this show. And so if part of her arc was to realize that she is saying all these things and kind of like parroting hot button topics without actually practicing them, like she speaks over uh, her adopted sister all the time, like she speaks over Molly all the time and is wrapped up in her drama while also dismissing the idea of dating altogether or things like that. Like if she somehow grew as a character and grew in her ability to talk about social issues, that would be an interesting arc, I think, because I don't think I've seen that on a teen show before is like people trying to understand what it's like to be bombarded with internet culture and correction culture and things like that and learn how to actually become a better human and try to change the world in a positive way, but also not be extreme about it. I don't know. I'm not phrasing this exactly correctly. I agree completely, though. Like, I think I think you have absolutely hit the nail on the head. Like, it's one thing to say, like, okay, sure, she's 16 years old. And so she's just sort of regurgitating stuff that she's heard. And so it's, it's one thing to introduce her in that way, but to not have her grow at all, like demonstrates, I don't know, like a a derision for that character almost like that Mm -hmm. you just and in this way that I don't know like somebody is trying to make some like they think they're making some clever commentary on on that type of person Uh, I think is the 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 my more cynical read of this is somebody thinks that they are clever for pointing out like oh look she doesn't know what the fuck she's talking about she's just regurgitating talking points and I think even if you step back and you don't and like and you assume assume more of them that like that that wasn't intentional i i still think that it is not showing a tremendous amount of respect for the character that they have created to not allow her to grow at all beyond that mm-hmm. i have one more point on the idea that they are just kids because they they all are just kids dealing with you know evil parents murdering parents and all of that but <laughs> um, going As back you do. to something we said when we were watching Mrs. Maisel, we talked about how she wasn't a great mother, but we also didn't want to watch her be a mother, like on the show. Like we don't care about her kids. I feel like I've complained in the past about teenagers being like intrepid investigators and how unbelievable that is. But I realized while watching this that I don't want to watch teenagers be really sucky investigators either. (laughs) (laughs) I really don't want to watch you (laughs) suck at this and have clues dropped in your lap and do really like obviously stupid things like at one point Nico finds her dead sister's cell phone or her backpack and she's looking through the backpack in her sister's room instead of like taking it away and then she plugs the phone in in her sister's room and just leaves it there when it's like an important clue so things like that were frustrating me the entire time and I was like huh this is why People write teens that are better at things than they should be. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I agree. Sari mentioned Molly with regards to Gert, and that is another character that I feel like we haven't talked enough about. 
sweet, sweet Molly. <laughs> <laughs> I loved Molly. I I really liked the whole idea of the the little girl in the group basically also being the super strong badass. I th- I think that like just as a part of the core concept of the show, I love that. We've talked about some you know some ways in which withholding information was dealt with badly and and there are a number of things but I think that where Molly is concerned that was largely handled very very well like the idea that Gert as her older sister was often dismissive of her just like oh yeah this is you know my kid sister whatever and everybody else too because they're like oh yes we are we are 16 and you are but a lowly 14 year old like you you do not know things and I don't know just like that whole dynamic I was constantly sad for Molly because I was like everyone should just shut up and listen to Molly but I I just yeah because Molly was great I don't know I loved her. Chase had that great moment where he was like going around dishing insults to everybody. And at one point, he was just like, and Molly. And everybody looks at him. He's like, what? I just think she's really great. And I was like, me too, Chase. (laughs) (laughs) She's great. (laughs) Yup. I thought she was really good. I thought I like cared about her. I wanted her to just be happy. She had a really compelling Part of her story was her adoptive parents had to send her away because she let it slip that she had seen the ceremony. The parents didn't know that their kids had seen them sacrifice this girl, but Molly had let it slip to Alex's parents that she had and was under a lot of suspicion specifically. And she had to be sent away to a an aunt's house or a relative. I don't, I don't know if it was an actual relative or just a friend of the family. And she had a scene where she was really emotional about that and like really sad about and angry that she was being sent away when she already feels like she's the one without a family. And she's like, that's a huge fear of being an adopted kid and being pushed away. And I thought all of her struggles were really, really compelling emotionally too and she did the right thing when she had more information she found a vhs tape left by her parents and she immediately went back to the group and was like hey look at this evidence i found let's watch it together um so she's like consistently moving forward in her own investigations which is figuring out what happened to her parents and moving forward the group part of her superpower is that when she exerts herself she's super strong she gets drained and so i'm like not I'm never going to not love a character who's like napping everywhere. And every time that they looked around and they were like, where's Molly? And they turn around and she's instantly asleep. I was like, yeah, girl. Like, that's the character of my heart. That was the one that was made for me. She's also going back to what Sari said earlier about like the blending of the sort of teen soap stuff and the superhero stuff. That stuff was particularly well handled with Molly. Like she, they, I mean, this is like so basic of of ways to do it but it was still like well done like it begins she discovers her powers concurrent with like she's starting her period basically it's sort of and so like they think that like the might you know she's she's just having cramps basically but it's like actually her superpower her superpower is being activated and like like while that particular blending is not exceptionally clever it was still well done like it was well it was well employed that like whenever she like she gets super emotional and like her eyes start to glow that like her like her powers are starting to activate because she's having a fuck ton of feelings and so she wants to hulk smash something and like that that intertwining i think was was done very very well that whole idea that she is a hormonal teenager with a ton of feelings and that that also like bleeds into her powers i think i think that yes i think that molly was probably the best example of that consistently being of those two threads being woven together consistently. Carolina also had one of those moments, and I'm not sure. I just thought about the fact that she did, so I don't know how I feel about this yet. But she had a similar thing where she decides that she wants to rebel. So she ends up going to a party, and part of her rebellion is taking off her cult bracelet, which she's worn basically all her life. And when she does, that's when she finds out first discovers that she glows in the dark basically and at that party she also sees two girls kissing and she looks at them kind of longingly which is your Mm -hmm. first in you know your first uh, indication that she might be a lesbian but then she passes out for reasons that I think we don't 
fully understand because later on she's without her bracelet fine and she gets carried away by two guys at this party and it's almost like she's sexually assaulted and she's almost raped so it has that crossover of like the first time she discovers her powers she also has like a very teen problem along with it but yeah. I, I'm not sure if that one worked as effectively as the Molly one, but she did have the moment as well. I think so. I think to me, I don't question the fact that she passes out. Like to me, that was just like something happened that was like overwhelmingly intense and she didn't expect it. She didn't see it coming. And like that, that's that is why she passes out. And in subsequent times, like because she knows it's coming, like she is like braced for it, you know? Yeah. I don't know. So like that, that, that half of it. Cool. The back half of it. I have mixed emotions about because it was like literally just a setup for Chase to save her. Mm -hmm. And that was a little like, mm, could have, could have done without that. <laughs> I, I guess I'm not really sure how else we get them all showing up at the, his, at Alex's house at the end, which is ultimately what needed to happen. But I feel like you could have gotten there some other way. Like they could just run into each other at this party and like, you know, decide that it's not their scene. Like, you know, like you could get, you could get there. Other, because that's ultimately what it was, right? Is them being like, Ugh, "This is we don't want to be here. This place is stupid." And there's other ways that you can get there without, like, uh, without that an whole attempted rape arc for Kara. <laughs> yeah, without an attempted rape. Um, which again, this is this is a a longstanding uh, snark squad topic, but an attempted rape that is and not actually about the victim of that of that rape. Like, it is there for Chase. It is not there for for Carol. Like, and they don't have her like. There is a scene between Carolina and Gert where Carolina first finds out that, she, you know, the rumor is that she hooked up with both of those guys and she's like, oh, my God, like, I, you know, I would know. And, and like that scene is is like, yes, very heartbreaking, but also that is the sole extent to which like it's, you know, they acknowledge <laughs> that like this should have been about her like that as a storytelling device was about Chase and Mm, not a fan. Chase and yeah, his sports team <laughs> relationship. Like it became a bigger deal that he had a falling out with them than yes, yes, Carolina yes. processing the fact that she was almost sexually assaulted the first time she decided to rebel. Yes. Or she was sexually assaulted and almost raped the first time she decided to rebel. Well, yeah. speaking of James Marsters. <laughs> <laughs> the, the subtext there. <laughs> I don't actually have a, a point. I just wanted to mention. <laughs> just wanted to. Just wanted to make that that text. I think that is also the the subplots that I wish the show handled a lot better were the really dark ones. So like the sexual assault and the abusive parent yes. in James Marsters. Yes, I feel like th that is something that Chase should have had to grapple with and he did in some scenes like there were a lot of back and forth between him and his mom of like dad's on alien juice now <laughs> so he's acting really happy and lovey and like I want to rebuild our relationship with him but then he kept flip-flopping a lot yes and he never really like besides showing flashbacks where you saw the extent of abuse that he went through like he won a lacrosse tournament and his dad slapped him across the face because he was being he was like complaining because he was sad that his dad yeah. didn't come to his yeah. yeah yeah like a very reasonable small child sad thing to happen yeah. um but we didn't see him grapple with that as a teenager i feel like he when his dad was showing him attention he was really excited to be sh working on the same project and he went very quickly from hating his dad to caring whether he lived or died. And there was not and a lot of And also hating like, his mom when that happened to, yeah. Uh, yeah, his cruelty is like the flip to being mean to his mother was also just like, ugh. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, the... Speaking of James Marsters, like this is this is also uh, another, uh, uh, you know, can't can't separate out uh, old, old feelings of like, like, I just wanted them to make up their minds. And and really, I guess it's not even that I wanted them to make up their minds. I wanted them to acknowledge like what was already canon heading, like what they started, what they introduced as canon in like episodes one and two, basically, which is that he had been instrumental in the annual murder of a teenager and also consistently beat the shit out of his wife and child. This is not a good man, mm -hmm. period, full stop. 
this is not a good man. And the like weird, he was the worst one, I think, for me of all of them in that like the like back and forth of like oh but we're trying to add all this nuance and complexity to the to the parent characters he was the one that I had the least patience for because it was just like uh, no this guy fucking sucks and like no amount of happy father son scenes that you show me are going to change the fact that this guy fucking sucks and the the degree to which like my issue isn't chase not being sure about his dad because I can get behind, you know, this is his father. And so he wants to, you know, that is complicated. This is his father, Janet. This is her husband. Like for them, it's complicated. But the fact that the show also see like the actual like show's perspective also seemed to be that it's complicated was it's not like it's not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not complicated. I yeah, I don't know. So that that was that was troublesome for me. It kept feeding us all this ways, that, all these ways that we were supposed to feel bad for James Marster's character from his brain tumor, and they they included this one scene that I was just like, where the hell did that come from? And it's just a day that Chase is born and he's holding the baby, and he's like, oh, <laughs> yeah. I get it, I get why parenting is awesome. I love this baby. Yeah, that counts for <laughs> shit if you spend the next sixteen years of his life beating him up. Like, what is yeah. the show mm-hmm. trying to tell us with that flashback? Like he had one good day congratulations right. like <laughs> yeah I, mostly what that flashback sequence did was make me feel real sad for janet yes. yeah like the the thing that they didn't uh, that i feel like I, I would have liked to see more of and if they want to get into like the complexity of the parents the thing the, that janet is somebody who i was like genuinely very intrigued by because that flashback introduces the idea that she was like really fucking smart and basically sat on the sidelines to aid her genius husband basically and instead of using her skills and stuff and I that yes that would that was like a, a this like thing that was kind of casually teased that I was like oh okay mm-hmm. <laughs> She had a line about it, too. Like, yes. when they were talking, she's like, I chose to be a stay-at-home mom for Chase. And then James Marger's character went on to be the gen- like the engineering genius. But it, you got the impression that she could have been the one to build the pods. Right. And right. done all the engineering stuff that he got credit for. But she just, like, decided to take care of her son. Yeah. Later, it was later in the in the series after James Marger's attacks chase with the like glove the fistigons and janet shows up and shoots him and then you know the whole the pride assembles to to try to save him because basically because james marsters is deemed like the most necessary of the members of the pride because he is the one who makes the pods that uh although uh, supposedly what's the alien guy's name jacob that was like the last sacrifice like they jacob like he had all the Jonah, Jonah, Jonah sorry. thank you. That's it. I yeah. was like, it starts with a J. <laughs> <laughs> Jonah, yeah. yeah. Jonah, he like had, supposedly had all the sacrifices, so not entirely clear on whatever. It doesn't matter. They, yeah, so he was the, he's the one who makes the pods. So basically Jonah's like, this this is the most necessary of all of you. And so, and like all, then, then they have this big internal squabble over who, you know, who has to be sacrificed to save him. And and yeah, her her speech in that moment, basically about like, like, yeah, I get it. I get why I'm why you're all saying that I'm so useless. But like, like, I gave like you guys all got to get cool shit out of this bargain that got us to this moment. And I got nothing Mm -hmm. like (laughs) I got I gave up everything. And like, essentially, all I received in return was like, I don't know, a hope for like a better future for my son (laughs) is basically the like was like was the gist of it. But it was like so it was a small thing that I I like I wish I don't know that I wish that there had been more. I guess exploration of that. I guess of all of all of the parent stuff, that to me was was high on my list of like interesting mm-hmm. <laughs> moments. Acknowledging that we're talking about a bunch of child murderers who basically serial killers <laughs> because yep. they do this uh-huh. across a span of 15 years or so. So a bunch of serial killers. Were there any of the parents that you guys liked more than the others, or you found more tolerable? Personally, I really liked Gert's parents and if they had been if if the parents were more solidly evil I think they would be the ones that I would feel more conflicted about I felt like they felt like they had the m- strongest most loving relationship outside of the fact that they were serial killers and maybe it's just like the way in which they demonstrated love to each other is 
one that matches with my head model of what a healthy relationship looks like. Uh, and so I acknowledge that because like Alex's parents also were fiercely protective of each other, but they were just they kept secrets from each other, whereas Gert's parents felt like they were approaching all their biology projects. It's probably because they're scientists, too. I <laughs> you got a soft spot. Yeah, I got a soft spot for nerd crunchy parents uh, <laughs> who like raise dinosaurs in their basements. <laughs> um, but also I felt like the fact that they had a good relationship with Molly's parents and were interested in the fact that they were maybe digging down for renewable energy and were the people that Molly's parents called when they were beginning to become really afraid of what they were discovering makes me think that they would maybe want to turn the tides more than others. I don't know. I just thought they were interesting characters. They seemed like very good invested parents, despite the clearly evil <laughs> things that they've despite done. Despite also being serial child yeah. murderers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, my only, I took two notes. My notes were like very like scattered and not, they were all very surface level. I did take two notes about the parents, which were uh, Carolina's mom had some very good acting. Moments. I mean, a lot of the, I mean, both the sort of the two Jonah and then James Marshers, like those, those two characters. Well, Victor Stein, mm -hmm. Jonah and Victor Stein, obviously both of them were as wonderful as, uh, you know, like they played their parts well. Uh, but Carolina's mom was also somebody who stood out to me mostly in her scenes with Carolina's like the, the, the man that she believes to be her father. There were a number of scenes with him that it was like there was something very well acted, I guess, about like the that like exuding something but also the undercurrent of restraint and like I'm not really into this and like I don't know I thought there was there, there were a lot of like layers going on there and I thought she acted it very well like the character is like, obviously one of the more evil characters like that her mom is is very all in on on uh <laughs> she's the one who is handpicking the children that they murder every year basically so you know I, meh. She also murdered Molly's parents. She murdered she, Molly. Like, threw a bomb in yes. and locked the door. Yes. Uh, yeah. So and then <laughs> hid it from everyone else. Yeah. So this is not this is not really an answer to your question about which parent I liked. Uh, just the acting. I thought she was well. I thought that the actress did a very good job. I also thoroughly enjoyed all of Nico's mom's fashion choices. Yes. Um, <laughs> that the was my was other just big gorgeous. note. Every time she was on screen, I was like, whoa, yeah. I want your eyeliner. I want your lashes. Like I want everything you're wearing, <laughs> everything you're doing. And it was also it's we we talk a lot about you know the moment where you like when you're watching teenager shows and you cross over to starting to identify with the parents instead of the teenagers. And this like because the parents all suck so much, you know, didn't really have that experience. But like the moment that I was like, oh no no no, like the, my fashion icon of the show is a parent, not <laughs> not a teenager. <laughs> it's for sure Nico's mom. Like that's that's the one whose wardrobe I want. That's all I have about the parents, though. <laughs> I think that I had the same moment with Gert's parents where I was like, but they love each other and they're so cheesy. They had like that cheesy mom and dad feel to them, um, yeah. which I thought was great. They had an offhanded line where they're when they were at the food truck, which I I don't know if I like interpreted wrong, but it was almost they were celebrating the fact that they were almost about to sell the serum that they developed, which we don't hear a lot about, but it's a big deal. And they say something like, and we'll finally be able to stop hurting people. And I don't know if they were referencing to the child murders, which they participated in, or if it's also implied that they were like testing on people, but oh. the entire thing. And then they also have like cages full of animals in, in the downstairs. So there were moments for each of the parents where I'm like, where I would like go back and forth. And um, so that was one where I was like, yeah, I can't, I can't feel good about you anymore. <laughs> like <laughs> That's a really good point. I like, I did not register that, but also like, and it's I am not clear on whether the show was was being deliberate about that or not. But that is a very good point because they do elsewhere explicitly state that that serum when um, uh, Alex's mom is going to use it on Molly, Alex's dad is like uh, that thing like totally fucked up. Carolina's dad <laughs> so oh, yeah. to the, the teenagers but like so like it's it is stated elsewhere that the serum is like potentially quite harmful to humans so uh, yeah it's 
I, yeah, I don't know. I read that as being about the sacrifices when I was watching it, but it is just as plausible to me that that it is also relevant to the, like the, the testing that went into creating the serum. And I don't know. I, yeah, maybe this is also my wishful thinking because I would like I, I again wish that they just leaned more into the idea of like the parents are super villains and then the kids are going to become superheroes like mm-hmm. that. I was going to like reiterate that point because, you know, for every moment that we have, like even Carolina's mother, you know, she's obviously I think the most evil and the most committed to the the plan but then they also have that moment where they show a picture of her as you know a, a young child standing next to Jonah and I got all kinds yeah. of creepy vibes there as well like we don't know how long this kind of child grooming was going on and there were moments where you saw that they were put in compromising situations but then you just had to remember about the child murders and then they each <laughs> had like an additional bad thing so you know uh, I, I would say that Nico's mom was being very almost like emotionally abusive to her. You have um, Victor Stein being physically and emotionally abusive. You have the scientists doing some freaky lab shit and, you know, maybe testing on people, maybe testing on animals. So each of them, like, and then you have, like, the ex-con and the lawyer who were up to, like, shady business and, like, shooting up people. And, you know, he he killed, he was one who, like, physically delivered a young boy to be to be murdered. So right. they had additional things on top of the child murders to make them all extra bad. And the fact that the show just couldn't acknowledge that was really frustrating. Yeah. And and the thing is, too, even with Leslie, the like child grooming and stuff, I think all of that is because they're trying to ground it a little bit more. I think all of that works as your villain origin story. Like this is why she wound up this way. And I even like, I, I don't know. And, and I even I even buy that, you know, in light of being the super villain, like she still loves like loved her daughter enough to help her daughter escape at the end. Leslie facilitates in sort of small part, Chase and Molly breaking Carolina out of Giborum, which is where she had been held after like this big showdown with the parents and whatever. And and like all of that checks out. Like she can still be like she can still be a supervillain. We can show that like she has been groomed into being a supervillain. Like she had a really fucked up childhood and like that's how she ended up where she is and like it sucks, but also, you know, she's making choices as an adult and they're evil, but also, you know, she's she can be evil and like still love her daughter enough to want to get her daughter out of this situation. Like that tension cool I'm on board it was again as as we have as we keep saying (laughs) just all of the other places where it's like wishy-washy and like no they're just all like conflicted and complicated and like I eh. I mean no like they're evil people who also happen to love their children basically like and and like just like that let that be (laughs) the like the extent of the conflict I guess I don't know but speaking of Carolina, by way of her mom. <laughs> it's a really good segue there. I I did not know going into this that like there was any queer representation on this show. I did as soon as they had the moment where like she looks at the two girls at the party, I immediately like got on Google. I was like, is am I being is this like is this like a queer baiting thing? Or like is this gonna be a real is this real, basically? <laughs> so I, I spoiled myself because I needed to know if this was going to be real <laughs> or like, you know, if I could just expect, you know, like if my dreams were gonna be dashed, I wanted them dashed like immediately. <laughs> I didn't want to be holding out that hope, basically. So yeah. I think I had sort of mixed feelings about the delayed like of like the way in which her struggle was handled and mostly I wasn't sure exactly why but Mari actually kind of hit on on why it was it was because we took so long for her to also like be comfortable with her powers. And I think like, I think like letting it be one or the other (laughs) would have made it a lot better that like, okay, here, all of my friends can know that I am, you know, rainbow and I glow and whatever. And like, but like I'm holding this other secret and like that sort of tension, I think would have, would have greatly improved the handling of that story. But that aside, like other than the like, I mostly it's it's that I wish that like her Carolina's like coming to terms with herself had been that you I don't know maybe you separated out those threads a little bit like the the, the alien thing 
<laughs> and the lesbian thing. I, I think I think if you I think separating those threads out a little bit more and and having her grapple with them in slightly different ways, I would have appreciated. But I, I still you know, I also just like appreciated that the representation was there. And and I also I was expecting the whole thing with Nico to kind of end in disappointment for her because it seemed like the show really seemed to be setting up Nico and Alex as endgame. And so the fact that Nico turned out that I did not see coming, the fact that Nico ended up being bisexual witch icon (laughs) (laughs) was was another like pleasant surprise. And I was like, oh, okay, All right, show. Thank you. I enjoyed that they made it seem, at least to my interpretation, that Carolina was grappling with maybe admitting it or telling her friends, but never really with her feelings. I feel like she knew all along that that's what she wanted and that's what she liked. And when the moment came, she was decisive and she went in and she did her thing. And, you know, she she ends up being the one that initiates with Nico and she gives her kiss at the end of the world, which is such a teen trope that I love. (laughs) Why not? I love it. Kiss at the end of the world. Yeah. Um, Yeah. (laughs) um, But I, I like that portion of it, that it was never like a, oh, am I? It was more like, do I tell these people yes. about it? Yes. So I, I appreciated that yes. portion of the representation. And I did the same thing. As soon as she looked over at t- the two girls kissing, <laughs> kissing scene, like my search history is like Marvel's runaways, LGBT rep, like question mark. <laughs> <laughs> And the internet did, in fact, tell me that she was a uh, lesbian. So I was pretty happy about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I totally, I, I, I definitely agree. Like that it, it was great that it was the, the struggle was with coming out, not with like who she actually was. I just wish that there could have been more weight given to the like coming out as like that being her central conflict, you know, because the the sort of supernatural whatever elements of this world were introduced so quickly that like, I don't know. Yeah. As as you said before, like them taking so long to reveal their powers. I think this all would have worked much better if like those pieces were on the table first. And then like all of the sort of, you know, teenager like, ah, who I like, like that kind of stuff. Like, I think that that would have worked a lot better to have those pieces be the things that they were withholding, but relying on each other to grapple with the supernatural pieces early on. I like that a lot. Yeah, I would enjoy that so much. Uh, And I think it would be really interesting. I also... I'm just really happy with the representation. I did not Google it, so I was complete. I was like waiting for the queer baiting <laughs> to <laughs> resolve itself, but very pleasantly surprised when it when it actually came to fruition. But I think that would be really interesting, especially in contrast to like maybe Nico's storyline, because it seems like throughout the whole series, her main grappling point was coming to terms with. Uh, her parents and her family life and the death of her sister especially and like when Alex was there it was convenient for them to bond and like they had a history together and she looked to him for comfort but now she's finding that she can look to Carolina for comfort and it seems like especially fitting with her goth witch attitude to just be like I like who I like you know it's fine (laughs) whoever I decide to like become close to that's whatever and contrasting that with Carolina's like actually internal struggle to do that uh, would be really interesting in a teen drama. Yeah, I think like having a coming out story and having someone who maybe doesn't feel like it's necessary to bring up with her friends. She's just open with the fact that she's has this sexual tension going on with multiple people in the friend group and just like, whatever, <laughs> none of your business. I think they did a good yeah. job showing from Nico's point of view that she was never 100% comfortable or on board with Alex. I feel like there were a, t- a couple times that he would come on to her that she was like, whoa, and he was more the one initiating and pushing. Mm. And so mm-hmm. that was nice in contrast to when Carolina kissed her and she was like, yep. I'm about this. <laughs> but you, you, bought, you bought it. Like you believed it because there was that instant chemistry and it felt kind of like she was more into it than she ever was with Alex. So I like that too. And with that, we can end this on a high note. Thank you, Sari, for joining us again. And thank you to all of you for listening. If you would like to let us know what you think of Runaways and this episode and the podcast in general, you can 
subscribe and rate us on iTunes. You can also find us at snarksquad.com where there will be a post for this episode and you can share your feelings there or subscribe to our newsletter and join our Discord. Or you can find us on Twitter at snark underscore squad. I am at Sweeney Says. You can find me at my name is Marines. I'm at C.E. Riley. And thank you to Stefan Chin for our fancy theme music that is playing us out right now. Bye. Bye. Bye.